All right, everyone, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Trending Echoes, brought to you by Trends Research and Advisory. I'm your host, Omar. I'm very excited here to be joined at COP28 by a very special guest, Erin Sikorsky. She is the director of the Center for Climate and Security. Welcome to the studio, Erin. Thanks so much for having me, Omar. It's a pleasure. Joining us all the way from where, D.C.? Washington, D.C., yep. How are you finding Dubai? Uh, it's lovely. Uh, what I've seen of it so far, I've seen a lot of COP. <laughs> COP28. <laughs> yes, COP28. <laughs> Speaking of COP28, uh, today is Energy, Industry, and Indigenous Peoples. So we're going to want to just touch on that a little bit. Uh, but given your area of expertise when it comes to geopolitics and how climate change shapes geopolitics, is there what, what sort of direct effect is there on Indigenous people, if anything? Sure. I mean, Indigenous peoples are often on the front lines of climate hazards right, affecting their communities, whether it's through drought or flooding or extreme other extreme weather events. Um, they're experiencing the direct security risks uh, from, from climate change. The good news is that they often also have really uh, strong uh, strategies and approaches for managing these risks from their years of living close to, to nature and, and their communities. And so they can teach the rest of us lessons about how to manage in this warming world as well. Right. Now, uh, COP28 today is day six, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on the progress that's taken place uh, right here? Yeah, I think we've seen um, some small but good steps so far. It was wonderful to see the loss and damage fund on the very first day uh, be agreed to and, and money going into that fund. I think the leadership um, here in the UAE has helped make that happen. Uh, the other thing from the work that I do, I was really excited about was the uh, declaration on relief, recovery, and peace that came on a few days ago. The first declaration on discussion of peace and security at COP ever. And you had more than 70 nations, more than 40 organizations sign on to that declaration that climate, conflict, and peace are inextricably linked and we need to tackle them together. That was a really good step uh, in, in the work that I do. Now, uh, once you're immersed into all things sustainability, climate change, and so on, you tend to have a very good understanding on how that could affect uh, you know, politics in general. But believe it or not, for a lot of people out there, they really can't establish the connection. Help some of our viewers understand what sort of effect is there, direct or indirect, uh, on geopolitics when it comes to climate? Sure, I can give you a couple good examples. Climate change is reshaping communities' access to food and access to water, right? And those are the two things that, that peoples and states need to really survive. As countries look to gain new access to water resources or food resources, right, they're potentially coming into conflict with other states and other communities. Uh, we see this, for example, in fishing around the globe, right? As the oceans are warming, fish stocks are moving to new geographies within the oceans. As countries are looking to gain access to that food source, they're often entering uh, other countries' territorial waters. Uh, they're, they're competing potentially in the Arctic for access to these fish stocks as the fish move north. Um, and so it brings uh, new competitions in, in new domains that, that countries haven't thought about before. Also, as we transition to, crit, uh, to renewable energy, the need for critical minerals to uh, put in batteries, to put in solar panels, um, the competition for access to those critical minerals is also a geopolitical issue. Right. And uh, so, I mean, one would say, or people would actually say that uh, becoming more sustainable would actually create and cause a lot more conflicts because you're shifting mm. uh, resources from one place into another. How do you think that could be solved or avoided? Well, or can it be avoided? I think it can be managed, right? I think we know that it's a potential risk and so we can get ahead of it, right? That we can help countries, for example, that perhaps uh, are relying on fossil fuels to uh, support their economies today, places like Angola, uh, you know, um, Nigeria, and we can help them think through that transition and manage that transition in a healthy way as opposed to a disruptive way. I think it's, it's all about strategic foresight and knowledge and planning. Um, it's about the countries in the global north who have been responsible for many of the emissions, I mean, all, most of the emissions in history, um, uh, investing 
in climate finance to help manage uh, these changes so that we can do it in a more ordered and, and um, uh, sustainable way as opposed to a very disruptive way. Are there any examples of actual conflicts from a geopolitical perspective that have taken place based on climate change? Well, one example that's often pointed to is the Syrian civil war, that drought in uh, the country helped contribute to migration internally and then helped contribute to political instability in cities. Um, but it's rarely, if ever, climate change alone that drives a conflict. It's climate change layering on top of other risks and other challenges within countries when you have governance challenges, right? or you have uh, existing conflict. If you look today at the most vulnerable countries to climate change, many of them already have ongoing conflicts in them. So you layer that climate on top and um, you, have, you have further, further problems. Uh, what are your expectations from COP? What does Aaron wanna see come out of <laughs> COP28? Well, you know, I mentioned they had this declaration on relief, recovery, and peace. Uh, my understanding is the draft language of the global stock take uh, now has conflict sensitivity in, in the language for the first time ever. I want to see that language stay in and that link between conflict and climate make it into that document. I also want to see the discussions around adaptation um, make some progress and see more funding going into adaptation for countries. Because look, obviously mitigation, critically important, but there's enough carbon in the atmosphere already today that the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to have increased warming and countries are going to have to manage and adapt. And if we don't invest in adaptation, we're going to see more conflict and instability. Now, speaking of having enough carbon in the atmosphere, uh, how is there a way where we can actually measure or gauge uh, the progress that we're making over time? By reducing it or not? I mean, how, how does the average person actually gauge uh, how much, you know, we're doing in a positive or negative direction? Maybe even talking about, I mean, what is the current? Well, it's clear we're going current, in the wrong right? direction right now, right? right. Okay, so but how <laughs> so, do we gauge it, right? Yeah. Like, how do we gauge it? Because it seems to be quite theoretical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's how people experience it in their communities on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And right now, it gets back to the adaptation point and the resilience point. Con uh, communities can't manage a lot of these hazards. We're seeing hazards come more quickly and more intensely than climate scientists even predicted. I think if we can get to a place where communities have good early warning systems where they um, maybe we have uh, migration happening in such a way that is planned and not forced uh, to prepare to get away from some climate hotspots. Um, I think that will, will show communities that we're moving in the right direction. I think also, you know, the methane pledge the other day here at COP was a good step that you can concretely measure that if they follow through on those pledges, it will keep temperatures lower than, um, than we, uh, the trajectory we're currently on. And so as we you know, follow through on those pledges, I think communities can see that as well. But it's gonna be what's happening in their own backyard, not these, at, at um, these global meetings, frankly, for right. most average people. Right, now being from the United States, uh, do you see the US at least making enough progress or enough influence on a global scale to be able to uh, steer things towards more sustainability. And by the way, the reason I ask is obviously the U.S. being one of the biggest emitters in mm -hmm. the world with the latest financial contribution of, I think it was about 17 million, which mm -hmm. was significantly less than uh, anybody else, yet one of the biggest emitters. Yep. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think the United States needs to step up more on, on climate finance for sure. Um, and it needs to do that not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's an investment in the United States' own national security going forward. Buying down risk in these places where we uh, expect instability or conflict due to climate, getting ahead of it by investing in adaptation, investing in resilience, keeps America safe as well. So if you don't care about the rest of the world as an American, but you care about our own country, which unfortunately, um, you know, that's sometimes the case, um, it's, it's still a good thing to do. And so they need to do more. I think the Biden administration is, is leading here and, and really pressing, but they can't do it alone. They need the U.S. Congress to join them. Um, and that's where we need to really focus and make some progress. All right. Well, Aaron, thank you very much for being here with us. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing you once again. All right. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your time in Dubai. Thank you.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That was another episode of a Trending Echoes happening right here in the beautiful Expo City in Dubai. Be sure to tune in to the next episode. I was your host, Omar. We'll see you soon.